two talks into one, talking a little bit about endoscopic transorbital surgery. Um, no relevant financial disclosures, but um, I hope that by the end of the talk to convince you guys that transorbital approaches to the skull base do have a lot of advantages for select pathology. And I think the key in adopting these in your practice is, is starting with the appropriate cases, building gradually, and of course, multidisciplinary collaboration for the intracranial portion. So for those who aren't really familiar with transorbital endoscopic surgery, you know, the, a little bit at the corridor is not new. It's been used for lobotomy for many years and other things, but with the advent of the endoscope, it's really moved to the forefront of neurosurgery as a primary route for a lot of skull-based pathology. And if you look at some of the covers of the neurosurgery journals over the last few years, this is really front of mind. So if these techniques have not come to your institutions quite yet, um, they will be soon. And just to get a sense of the audience, how many of you guys are using endoscopes in your practice, whether for DCR or orbit surgery? You guys are using endoscopes. Quite a few. Okay. So these are sort of natural evolution. And you know, as orbital surgeons, we certainly already understand when we're doing decompression and tumor surgery, the intimate relationship between the anterior cranial fossa and the middle cranial fossa in the orbit. This is uh, something we encounter every single day. Um, and to remove the bone from these locations to access pathology on the other side, this is really standard stuff that we're doing in all of our thyroid decompression surgeries. Certainly some people get more wide dural exposure than others. I think the ad addition of the endoscope really allows you to very easily um, you know, and safely do this. So we'll just talk a little bit about the technique um, for incorporating your practice. Our basic setup is the surgeon stands on the operative side. Um, we typically utilize a scope holder, um, either an assistant or actually a mechanical scope holder that I'll show you. Um, and an assistant protracts the orbit. Um, the equipment is then positioned to the side with the anesthesia across on the other side. Um, the endoscope is helpful in these cases to minimize your dependence on having two assistants and to allow you to operate with just one assistant. So that you can kind of see here on the assistant the surgeon's left hand is holding the suction, the right hand is holding the drill, one assistant is retracting the orbital contents, um, and then the endoscope holder is, uh, is showing the view. And you can kind of see here there's a monitor directly across from the surgeon, and then another monitor at the foot of the bed that allows the assistant to visualize what's happening during surgery. So the bone that's removed in these approaches, again, is really the same bone that you're often removing in lateral orbital wall decompression. And we'll talk a little bit about that later, but essentially you're removing the bone between the supraorbital fissure and the interorbital fissure and then you're exposing this structure that we don't often encounter in oculoplastic surgery, which is the meningeal orbital band that's sort of an extension between the dura through the supraorbital fissure um, to the periorbita. When that's divided, um, essentially the, all the temporal lobes can be reflected and you have wonderful access to pathology in the you know, middle cranial fossa, the lateral cavern of sinus, um, the meccles cave moving further back, and even in the petrous apex. So this really is a powerful and direct approach to a lot of skull-based pathology that's otherwise challenging to reach and requires significant uh, retraction. So I think when you're kind of moving into these, um, it's important to build a team, collaborate with your neurosurgery colleagues, and I think start with appropriate cases. So this was the first case that my neurosurgeon uh, that I work with, Ted Schwartz, and I took on together when I was a fellow. Um, this was a 79-year-old woman who had basically a recurrent glioblastoma and needed a biopsy, a diagnostic biopsy. And you can see the you know, red arrow kind of pointing to the pathology in the middle cranial fossa and sort of extending into the lateral orbit. Um, and so it was something that was readily accessible. It was not a, did not require a lot of deep dissection was sort of a nice chip shot for our first case to do together. So the approach is pretty standard, but the difference is, again, we're using the endoscope here to really uh, allow us to have direct visualization. The bone is removed in the greater wing of the sphenoid, and a biopsy can be collected. So this was a pretty straightforward case, um, allowed us to get a diagnostic biopsy while avoiding a craniotomy, and closure is standard. And you can see pretty minimal morbidity at six days, looks just about like any other orbital decompression surgery would. Um, much better certainly for the interorbital band going through a craniotomy. Um, so kind of beyond some of these easier first cases, we started moving into extradural cases. So this was a challenging case of a, a dermoid cyst, essentially, that was causing a compressive optic neuropathy at the cranial node 3. She presented with ptosis and headache. Um, again, this would be sort of at the skull base, a difficult one to, to sort of access. You can see the relationship to the carotid artery um, and, you know, would require a lot of brain retraction to, to really access this. The, the orbit provides a relatively direct pathway. So this, again, we've now kind of moved past and, and we're having to remove the meningeal orbital band the temporal lobe. Let me see if I can kind of play the video over again. But this sort of play the video. Um, so dividing the meningo orbital band is kind of the key step that I think is one of the initial challenges when you're learning this approach. So again, just an eyelid crease incision, divide the orbicularis, subperiosteal dissection, and then we're drilling the bone between the greater wing of the, uh, the sphenoid, basically between the superior and anterior orbital fissure. Once we start to get dural exposure, you can switch to curettes or kerosens to help, you know, just like you might in a lateral decompression, um, to open up the, the bone in that area and to really get wide dural exposure. And you can start to see the brain there, that's the temporal lobe. Um, and then 
once that bone is removed and the satchel crest, which is the lateral aspect of the supraorbital fissure, is, is exposed, you can see the meningoorbital band there, which is divided. Once that meningoorbital band is removed, you really can widely reflect the temporal lobe, and you can see the drainage of the cyst there, and that should be a lateral main cyst. So that kind of shows the you know, basic steps of surgery nicely. Um, and this is our patient, again, monthly, fairly limited morbidity compared to the morbidity for a young patient who goes through a craniotomy and you have resolution of a lot of those types of things. So this same corridor provides a really direct pathway to uh, pathology in these multiple locations. Uh, we've done intradural, extradural. I think the key, again, is starting small, getting comfortable with the equipment, getting comfortable with the approach, and having a good, close working relationship with your neurosurgeon. And most recently, we've kind of progressed to bigger uh, intradural cases, whether it's intradural meningioma, intradural gliomas. Um, but it's really the, the, the approach is the same. But here's an example of a temporal lobe meningioma, again, right at the skull base, would require a significant craniotomy and a lot of extraction. And this is an approach that you can just, from the orbital surgery side, just like a lateral wall decompression, subperiosteal dissection, uh, exposing the superior and inferior orbital fissures, drilling that greater than this you know, uh, to expose the temporal lobe, and then approaching this uh, laterally. This one is a little different in that we're actually gonna open the dura. So you'll see the, the technique of sort of drilling um, hand over hand. I think the endoscopic visualization really gives you high magnification, nice resolution that allows you, once you get down to dura, to really feel comfortable about safely removing the, the bone and, and blood vessels into the, the dura. And then you know, shortly here, we're just removing the sagittal crest, which again is that lateral aspect, or in the right over here, it's really named the lateral aspect of the superior orbital fissure. Once it gets to the dura, of course, um, this is typically when I'll turn the case over to the neurosurgeon. And you can see our neurosurgeon here opening the dura with endoscopic scissors. Um, and shortly, he'll use a curette to essentially remove that intradural component. And you can kind of see the tumor starting to present itself there, but sort of using a hand over hand endoscopic technique to remove the tumor. So this is certainly in the domain of neurosurgery, but the approach, I think, for all of you is, is well within your skill set to do a high volume of orbital surgery. Uh, for dural reconstruction here, our neurosurgeon uses an inlay onlay graft, which is basically a sandwich of alveoli, one on the inside, one on the outside, and we use a seal to kind of give sliding one, one leaflet inside the dura, one leaflet outside the dura. We use tissial and typically abdominal fat to reconstruct that osteotomy, um, and then just a layered closure, sort of the standard fashion that I can skip for um, you know, sake of time. But you can see this patient on day zero, really fairly minimal morbidity until they say, oh, this essentially an intradural resection of the brain tumor, and at month three, really minimal morbidity at all, and then once they get to nine. So I think these are powerful techniques. I think these are coming to your institutions. Um, our experience, we've now done about 30 cases. Um, we published kind of our first 20 cases in, in Minnesota just last year, and we published a few of our results. The primary pathology or primary uh, side effects, I suppose, of morbidity is it's mostly been epistasia, probably from the frontotemporal and frontotegomatic nerves, uh, or nerves, uh, temporal tegomatic nerves. Um, we did have one uh, person blight syndrome, probably from impaired uh, venous outflow, venous congestion during the refraction. And we had one in the significant case of canal hyperostosis and stenosis meningioma. We had a couple patients with count fingers pre op, hand motion pre op to NIC on the lincolizabin. You know, cases I think no matter what the approach that would have been challenging to treat, um, but other than that, we really haven't had significant ophthalmos, um, we haven't had significant vision changes in the context of the business. And if you compare kind of the early outcomes versus the late outcomes, we do see patients who have a little bit of necrosis kind of in the early postoperative period. Certainly everybody has eyes and swelling, but if you look at kind of our you know, three, six to 12 month follow-up, the complication rates are very rare. And as an orbital surgeon, kind of in these cases, I have to sort of frame my experience more on the neurosurgery side of things. So if you look at some of these, this is an orbitozygomatic approach, which would otherwise be used to approach the pathology in these locations. And you're looking at diplopia rates somewhere in the 25%, which I think, you know, as an orbital surgeon, we don't want any cases of diplopia after surgery or any cases of cranial necrosis or necrosis after surgery. But compared to the alternative options, you know, this is our fourth and, and our fifth choice. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'll skip through these, but I think these are Cherchen syndromes we had from this uh, different intradural meningioma, um, probably from the prominent morbidity in the frontal nerve and venous outflow congestion. Um, we had one CSF leak that was just treated with packing, oversewing the wound, and they put a lumbar drain. And since this case, this one was one we reconstructed the lateral wall with a PDF sheet. And since then, we've switched to doing that abdominal fat graft that I used and have not had a CSF leak since. Um, and this was a patient I mentioned who had kind of significant uh, intradural inter uh, canalicular disease um, that did go from sort of having a very suppressed visual field that you saw here preoperatively to seeing NLC afterwards. So I think, again, no matter what technique is used, this would be a challenging case, but if you had some unfortunate outcome in some areas, it's probably a worse outcome. So I think my perspective currently is that this is definitely here to stay. This is something that all neurosurgeons are gonna be doing, and I do think that as ophthalmologists, we have to have a role. Um, 
we have to help guide the decision making and if we have the best perspective to sort of guide some of the intraoperative decision making the surgery uh, and certainly following how kind of capturing risks and complications and things like that. So I think this movement's going to continue whether or not we choose to participate. I think it'll be up to us at our individual institutions but this is front of mind um, in, in the neurosurgery community right now. So I think it is important for us to, to take a leading role especially as orbital surgeons who have this expertise and allow our neurosurgery colleagues to lead this group safely. Um, so I don't want to hold up any, we kind of got a late start here, but just this technique that I learned from working with a neurosurgeon and doing the endoscopic assisted uh, approaches can actually be translated to lateral wall decompression for thyroiditis, even if you shorten this up significantly. But in my practice now, this is sort of how I've handled bone in the lateral orbital wall. The green uh, section I still will do with the loops. I think it's so anterior, it's awkward in, in the endoscope. But for the deeper bone, and particularly the areas of thin bone overlying the dura, I think the endoscope gives you that kind of magnification, elimination, and really that nice deep depth of focus um, to do this aggressively and safely. So again, kind of in the right hand, as I showed in that uh, still shot earlier, holding usually a four millimeter drill to start and then a three millimeter drill at the apex. I like an angled drill to give you a clear view and it's typically a self-irrigating drill. So then in the left hand, you're holding uh, the suction, which allows you to, to clear your field of view. Um, the assistant is then holding the endoscope or you can use a scope holder. Um, and then just kind of one time showing a little bit of the drilling in the lateral wall. So same approach that you would use um, in one of these transorbital cases. And this is the last video and then we'll move on. Exposing the superior and inferior fissures just like you would in any other decompression. And I found using the scope, I feel much more comfortable getting a very deep decompression with wide dural exposure. And again, sort of using the suction in the left hand to clear your field, the drill to get dural exposure, and then an anchor tube to make sure that you're embarrassing the decision making and getting that deep neurofissure stuff to work out. So, and this just shows you how powerful this can be. I think this would be a difficult case um, to do if you weren't using the best visualization that might require a crank out. And for standard thyroid eye disease cases, I think it's just a powerful tool that allows you to be a little safer, but also more aggressive in your deep lateral wall decompression. So um, if you're interested in learning these techniques, I do help run two courses. One is at Cornell with my neurosurgery colleagues. Another is at Columbia with some ENT colleagues. Um, they both have sort of virtual option for participation, or if you're interested in coming to New York and learning some of these techniques in a hands-on fashion, um, they'd be happy to host you guys. So thanks again for the uh, opportunity to be here. And I don't think we're doing questions, so. Um, in this next is Xiao Pham, who's a clinical assistant professor at the University of Iowa. And he's going to talk about a novel algorithm for understanding uh, when you can treat orbital fractures. talking a little bit about a, an algorithm that we have come up with at the University of Iowa to help triage orbital fractures a little bit better. Um, this work was previously presented at APOPR DFEST, but as well as JAO. Um, these are the financial disclosures, um, not going to be into the topic. So as you know, orbital fracture can be associated with severe ocular and periocular injury um, that might require emergent management. So you know, as a uh, institution with a very large catchment area, um, it's hard to figure out which one of those uses need to be transferred to us for that management. Um, so currently there's not really a great standard that identifies who that is that would make sense to permit transfer. And even though there have, have been a couple of other studies and um, algorithms proposed, um, there's a wide range of specificities as well as none of them have really been prospectively applied to see whether or not they work. Um, so really this was born of needing to identify high risk cases So that's where this came from. We really wanted to develop a new fracture algorithm to help identify those patients um, and retrospectively uh, evaluate the other algorithms and see how they compare to ours. Um, and then also for our own benefit, we kind of wanted to see, you know, where were these cases coming from and evaluate what kind of travel burden might be needed in order to handle them. Um, so we did a retrospective chart review. We recorded data. We developed the algorithm. Um, and then we retrospectively applied uh, the other algorithms as well as ours and then um, just did a map So what we found is we just looked at all of the ophthalmology emergency room uh, consults in 2019. There's almost a thousand of those and about 150 were for orbital fractures specifically. Um, and then we further narrowed down to a, a total of 134 cases of high energy decompensate exposure for an orbital fracture. Um, so it was mostly male, um, average age was about 50, the mechanisms of injury seemed to be there, um, all with that uh, bicipital or uh, mandibular orbital fracture were the most common. Um, of those 134 patients, only 19 
has been actually identified with emergent ocular and or periocular lesions. Um, those are the ones that we consider to be emergent or urgent. Orbital compartment syndrome is the most common. Open globe, um, muscle entrapment, uh, rupture, thermal injuries, and then of note, we actually didn't identify any retinal detachment in these patients in this cohort. Um, so as far as the algorithm development, um, it was you know a regression, a logistic regression model was created, and we actually created two models, um, one called Hope and then one called Hope PT, and I'll go into that a little bit there next. Um, the factors that we took into play in developing the algorithm included things like age and gender, um, whether the injury occurred with a foreign body, what day of the week uh, the injury occurred, the mechanism of injury, whether things like fracture locations or type of fracture, eye laceration, you know, visual acuity, you know, um, eye exam type of findings, motility findings, heart acuity findings. Um, this all went into the original HOPE algorithm that we developed, and then the second one, the HOPE PT, we actually included PT interpretation by an ophthalmology professional. So um, PT uh, evidence of an open globe injury, things like for flattened lobes or um, uh, intra, you know, intravitreal hemorrhage, um, retrobulbar hemorrhages, and then extraocular entrapment uh, by PT. And that's, you know, a little bit controversial, I think, right? Because we always say extraocular muscle entrapment is really a clinical diagnosis, um, which is why a lot of times you see this PT read by the radiologist as saying, you know, um, this is a fracture, possible muscle entrapment, clinical correlation recommended, right? Um, so a radiologist called both of these images possibly cracked. Um, the top image by the uh, ophthalmology views, there was less than two to the picture on the bottom where you clearly see that tension, that inferior rectus muscle being pulled down into the fracture. Um, and so for that one, that would be a true muscle entrapment as per ophthalmology views, um, whereas the upper one, not so much. And so I think this was a, a difference in the algorithm. Here are the numbers of all of the, you know, that were run with all of the different variables. And essentially for the hope, things like age, mechanism of injury, foreign body, all of those were factors that kind of popped up as important With Hope PT, you can see it's actually really narrowed down. Um, you can see in bold are the ones that are common to both of them. Um, but with the addition of the ophthalmology angle bead of the PT imaging, it really sort of limited the other um, factors that, that became important in determining whether or not there was going to be a concurrent severe emergent injury that, that occurred with this fracture. Um, so we took the Hope and Hope PT and actually compared them to a couple of existing algorithms that, that were out there in the um, there's something, one of them came from the University of Texas, and I think I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that it's a cooperative patient, um, right? Predictors of severity of urgent impairment and sorts of things that you as a cooperative patient I ideally would assess. Um, this algorithm did have a pretty good sensitivity and specificity, however, but I think it was limited by the cooperative patient portion of things. Um, South Texas had an algorithm that was mainly aimed at trying to reduce the number of ophthalmology complications that were occurring. Um, they also, you can see, incorporated radiographic overleads um, into their algorithm, um, and they found that it reduced the consult rate at least emergently in emergency room by 50%, um, and they ended up only needing to intervene, you know, in some of the patients at 5% of their cases. Um, Massachusetts Eye and Ear also had an algorithm that sort of had a bed size um, exam component to things, so they applied it to about 100 eyes. Um, had a really good sensitivity, but not so great of a specificity uh, for um, emergent ocular injuries in setting of fractures. So when we took our cohort from 2019 and ran the numbers with the other algorithms compared to ours, um, the whole PT was completely the best, right? Very sensitive, very specific, had a good positive predictor value as well as negative predictor value. And so we were pretty excited about that. Um, and, and this is a picture of like why we sort of did this in the first place, right? So University of Iowa sits in the middle of a really large sort of landmass area. We get a lot of transfers in. Um, you can see the little scatter plot there of where everybody came from. And in general, almost everybody had at least two stops total, meaning they came from some other institution before they were transferred to us. And on average, they traveled about 87 miles or 140 kilometers to get to us. Um, some patients traveling over 320 kilometers to get to us. Uh, which is a long way, you know, and a lot of these patients don't have the means necessarily to afford that kind of transportation, and then what happens when they get to us, right?
that they get dark and the kind of they get pale at night um, from those days. So, um, and this I think is a real kicker. Uh, transition from outside facilities is the, mo the biggest reason for these fracture um, and transfers. And if you look down there at the bottom right, like, you know, over half of the patients that we evaluated were ended up being discharged without further intervention, right? So we sort of felt like we could do a better job of figuring out who needs to come um, for, fur for further evaluation and nurturing them. And um, we think that the full CT protocol um, is something that we can do uh, that will help um, reduce unnecessary transfers, potentially lower costs for our patients, improve the distribution of the resources uh, that we do have, and of course promote safe, triage because certainly we don't want to miss any kind of um, emergent condition that we need to take care obviously there's limitations to this small sample size it is retrospective at, the, at right now um, and includes some patients sent for other trauma and I think the biggest thing is it does require the availability of CT imaging um, and an ophthalmology agent um, an ophthalmology agent that we've isolated has been trained at least to be able to do this so I think that will be one limitation in it but I you know I think we have something here we're going to we're actually actively con uh, continuing to work on it. So we're currently um, applying the algorithm to a larger co cohort of patients uh, that we're not using the original algorithm, and then we're going to refine it, um, test it again, and then prospectively test it, um, and hopefully with the goal of developing, developing an online tool that we can just share on the iRound um, website so the public can use it and, and people can help triage um, fractured tissue in their way if necessary. So. That's all I got. Those are some of the references for the al or algorithms that I talked about. Um, that's my team that helped put this all together. Um, and I just wanted to mention, I was going to give a talk on uh, hearing dysfunction and separate tumor map, but in the interest of time, I decided not to. Um, I'm happy to talk to anybody about um, the University of Iowa experience in hearing loss with the use of separate tumor map. Um, we actually just published in the ophthalmology journal about that a couple of uh, issues ago. Awesome, thank you, Chow. Uh, next, we have Dr. Harsha Reddy, who's an associate professor of ophthalmology. He's the director of ophthalmic, plastic, and reconstructive <laughs> surgery, and also director of the ophthalmology residency program at New York Ioneer on Mount Sinai in New York, uh, nice city. And he's gonna give us two talks today, first talking about thyroid eye disease, and then new frontiers, and then uh, a new curriculum for training oculoplastic surgeons at globally uh, resource-limited areas. So, Dr. Reddy. So this is how we traditionally think of thyroid eye disease from the outside in. And this uh, uh, presentation will be about thinking about it from the inside out. And these are my collaborators, Dr. Rosen and Dr. Cooley from our imaging lab at New York Pioneer. So to begin with, as a background, uh, macrophages have been known to exist in, inside the eye, both microglia and hyaloplasts from the 1800s. But in the 1970s and 80s, we started to understand themselves uh, more clearly with the visual lighting techniques at that time. And we understood that these are tissues or cells that reside in this tissue for long periods of time and they respond and change as they do. Fast forward all the way to today, we have a great ability to ima image these cells. Um, and so this is a highly magnified view of that uh, using the clinical photographs with the retinal vasculature and then the green represents the individual cells, the hyoplasts. And then the adaptive optics shows a super high magnification view of these cells. Just to kind of get us thinking about these two cells, so one on the left is in what's called the quiescent or inactive phase. It's kind of spread out like this, like a palm. And the one on the right is more consolidated. And you'll see in the video what happens. Uh, let me show you. See, the one on the right is moving a lot. So in the active phase, it moves um, and it's more bunched up, and then the inactive phase, it kind of spread out and doesn't move as much. So these are the two types of cells. So what does this have to do with thyroid eye disease? So we clinically think of it as having these phases, inflammation, proliferation, and fibrosis, and we measure it with a kind of rough measure of clinical activity score, but maybe there's something going on inside the eye that isn't getting measured. And so this is why with thyroid eye disease, this looks a little bit complicated. So this is an example of um, a patient that we imaged with this, presentation of various disease with 
uh, optic neuropathy, and we started an IV uh, treatment of septal cuts. And the protocol involves taking these high magnification scans around the fovea, and we compare it to preemptal uh, infusion uh, with this cervical T cell. This is how we, again, conventionally think of thyroid eye disease. The optic disc edema resolves with the treatment. The optic nerve changes improve, uh, resolve the clinical picture change. But what's going on inside the eye? So uh, on the left photograph, we see a surface uh, density map. The red and yellow show that there's a lot of cells there. And then the two images on the right show at a very high magnification both the number of cells and that it's kind of a consolidated or ball shape. And this suggests there's an active stage to these macrophages. And then post-treatment, there's a lot fewer cells, and the cells have changed shape to be more uh, spread out or inactive. So if we see them side by side, it's clear that uh, in the leftmost photograph, you have fewer cells. On the rightmost, you see that the shape of the cells has changed. So what does this mean? Um, we believe that with thyroid eye disease, you can actually see changes inside the eye, specifically in these macrophages uh, in the vitreous and in the retina. And how did the response to Epotuma mass specifically? There's a couple different theories. One is we have things directly with the um, cells uh, themselves responding to the anti-IGF uh, form. Or they could be a secondary mechanism such as uh, ischemia and the cells in the retina uh, releasing these and as the retinal signal decreases, the macrophages also respond accordingly. So this is a new way to look at thyroid eye disease, potentially a way to monitor uh, disease. I think a lot of us clinicians struggle with when exactly to start this treatment, how to monitor this treatment, and this might be a different way of looking at it that's more invasive and more doable. All right, so I'll switch to my second topic, which is totally unrelated, uh, but it's another one of my passions. Uh, this is a software that I developed with the group at Orbis International uh, with, with this group. Um, and I think it's useful for any of us who are involved in education and also for any of us who want to spread the word to op about osteoplastics to places where they may have less resources. Um, so this is a, a photograph showing Plato and Aristotle. Plato is pointing up to the heavens and Aristotle is pointing down to the ground. So this is a kind of balance between a kind of theoretical understanding and a real life understanding. So our trainees come in with this kind of textbook picture and then how do we make them learn the real life anatomy surgical diagram. So we decided to um, create a curriculum that would take them from the basics to the um, um, surgical knowledge. So um, I don't have to go over this in detail. Anyone who's involved in teaching residents knows that how they actually learn osteoplastics is quite varied. Um, they saw something online video, they read some part of the BCSD, and now they show up and they're like, okay, I'm ready to, to operate. Um, and there's a lot kind of gaps in that knowledge. So how can we bridge those gaps? This is even more the case globally. I was on a sabbatical last year where I was in Rwanda and there are zero osteoplastic surgeons full-time in Rwanda. So, and the ones that are there in many countries live in these urban centers and they don't have the time or necessarily training in how to teach osteoplastic surgery. This is how we teach at NeuroPioneer. We have all kinds of resources. And the last one is what we call Socratic teaching sessions. And this is what I actually do. Uh, these are my residents in, in my room. I tell them, okay, draw the lower lid anatomy. And then I tell them, how are you gonna deal with ectopia? How do you evaluate clinically? What are you gonna do surgically? What are the instruments you use? And then we watch a surgical video together. So this course I developed uh, with Orbis does all of that from start to finish. And it's interactive, so you test their knowledge acquisition throughout, and it's free to anyone in the world. So how does the course look like? Uh, this is what the opening page looks like. There are, um, 800 slides, uh, all of which I uh, created myself with photos and videos. This takes about four hours per course to do them and there's tests going through it. Um, this gives you a sense, we start with the very, very basics. What's anterior and posterior? How do you measure MRD1? Um, go to things like sterile technique, uh, positioning, what are your instruments? And then we get to surgery. So this is one of the examples of the questions uh, in, the, in the course. So label MRD1, Drive, drag these labels and kind of match them and if you don't get them wrong, it explains it to you. And then you go to something a little bit more advanced. And this is further along in the course. This is uh, surgery uh, for ridge margin involving laceration. Every ophthalmology trainee and lots of competent ophthalmologists 
need to know how to do this, but they, how they learn it is very varied. So the course goes over the basic steps, and then in real life, you know, how are we supposed to match up these terms to labels? Um, we all tell the resident to put a suture at the gray line, and they look at you like you have three heads. Um, so no, you know, rather than having them figure out on the fly, they can do it beforehand. And then we constantly go back and forth between this kind of theoretical understanding and the real life understanding for each step. Um, and then real life photographs. And then ultimately, you, what do you, what are the basic minimum things you need for the suture? What are the instruments? What are the sutures? And then the last part of it is, uh, is the video. Yeah. Okay. And the video is narrated um, showing that exact same step of aligning the red mark. If you're confident, the full 211 surgeon square knot can be tied. That's my voice scenario about that. The intermediate oculoplastic surgery course has um, more advanced um, topics going into uh, more different kind of soft, all kinds of soft tissue surgery, lid surgeries, as well as you know, eye removal surgeries. There's also a lot about clinical decision making. So everyone just learns ectropion on socket strength, ectropion on socket strength. Well, it's more useful to learn about the pathophysiology, is there laxity, is there anterior lumbar shortness? So this course kind of does in an interactive way um, teach residents um, how to make these kinds of decisions. Um, a practical experience, so I, I, like I mentioned, I taught in Rwanda last year. I had the residents take this course ahead of time, and then when I got there, I knew they had the kind of basic uh, knowledge so that everyone who wants to do global work it helps to know actually what the, what the folks there know. In our own residency program, uh, residents at every level of training actually, we discovered lots of gaps in their knowledge. Um, and this can be kind of done in a stepwise fashion where uh, the early parts can be done by first year resident, later parts by second year resident, and then for the senior resident, you're filling in hopefully things that kids already know. So globally, this course has uh, over 3,600 users in over 150 countries. And we're getting a lot of great feedback, so please use this to spread the word to anybody you know who might be interested in this, um, and give us feedback. Uh, it's free on CyberSite, and you can also email me after the talk. Thanks, Josh. Thank you very much, Hesha. Um, next, we have Professor El Tuki, um, who is a professor of ophthalmology at Cairo University and the director of the National Eye Center and the head of oculoplastic and lacrimal department who's gonna be talking about platelet-rich plasma nogen in dry eye disease. Thank you, Kyle, and uh, thank you for uh, Fairouz, Kasturi, Santos, and uh, the whole uh, scientific uh, committee and the organizers. It's always a pleasure being in India. Uh, I will talk about dry eyes and uh, the PRP uh, injection that we have been using uh, frequently actually in the last uh, couple of years or uh, even more. Uh, we all know what is platelet-rich plasma. It's the most commonly used biostimulator and uh, we know how is it prepared. It contains a lot of gross factors and uh, other factors that uh, promote healing and epithelialization and activation actually of cells and tissue gross collagen synthesis. Uh, there is very few studies about uh, the PRP and there is a lot of questions, yet it is widely used, widely used by dermatologists, for example. Every dermatologist injects PRP uh, in joints, uh, hair, we usually, uh, as an oculoplastic surgeon, many times we inject and use PRP for scars, for uh, uh, following burns, uh, uh, to, uh, for l l lash growth after some injuries, for the brow hair to grow after injuries. We have been trying and using this a lot. Although there is, we understand that there is no uh, scientific uh, data that really supports this, but we know that it helps. At least it will do no harm, which is the basics that we all learn about medicine. Uh, even in dry eyes, PRP has been used and serum has been used as an eye drop for uh, the, the ocular surface to promote healing of the corneal epithelium. So 
what we did is that we injected PLAS, a PRP, directly in the lacrimal gland in patients who has uh, evidence of aqueous deficient dry eyes. Definitely not meibomian gland dysfunction, but with aqueous deficiency, with tests, whether it's tear osmolarity, churmer, breakup time, tear meniscus height, when tests clearly shows that they have a reduction in the lacrimal gland secretion, we started using PRP injections in the lacrimal gland. We usually use three to four injections, one month apart. We had good results. We, we moved a step forward and we started to do it as a study and then we needed control. So we actually worked on several groups. Uh, one group, we did the injection on one side and we gave PRP eye drops on the other side, which is I'm going to present right now. But we have also another group that we're working on. Uh, you know, for studies and uh, for publishing, we have to be as low biased as possible. So we, the next group that we're working on, we are injecting PRP on one side and we're injecting normal saline on the other side as a, a control group. And because we also depend on the patient's response, we need the patient to tell us, did he improve or not? And definitely, if we inject on one side and give a drop on the other side, most probably he will say he, this, uh, he improved on the side that got the injection. So we had to give injections on both sides in the second group. This group is uh, the group that we inject on one side and give PRP as an eye drop on the other side. We, 50 patients, 44 of them were injected transconjunctivally, six of them were injected transcutaneously, and we followed them up using the churmer, the breakup time, and the tear meniscus height, as well as the OSDI, although we think that the, the patient would <coughs> will always favor and get biased to the side of the injection, so we did the other group as I explained. We had few complications, mostly of them were related to hemorrhage, and these are uh, the complications, subconjunctival hemorrhage, real orbital hemorrhage of subconjunctival, and another one of uh, lid edema, but none of them were visually significant and had no uh, long-term sequelae. The good thing is that the symptoms, the, the Schirmer test, the breakup time, and the tear meniscus height all improved on the side that got the uh, plasma rich platelet injection. This is a safe, simple, safe in our hands at least. We think it's very effective in aqueous deficient dry eyes. It can be added to the armamentarium that is being used. We're not scientifically, we, we don't have histological evidence of improvement of the lacrimal gland function, but we have both symptoms and we have clinical signs, evidence of improved tear film and symptoms of dry eyes. We'll, we're still working, it's, a, it's in the beginning, but we think it, 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 it is promising. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I think next we have, uh, the, yeah, uh, Dr. Francia Leone um, is up next, who's the director of the Adnex Sloan Orbital Service in the department of Villa Tiberia Hospital in Rome. He's a past president of the European and Italian societies and an international ASOP with member who's going to talk to us about combined surgical approaches for thyroid eye disease. Can you hear me? Yes. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for all the audience this afternoon. So this is my only financial disclosure. And we all know that we have to deal with moderate to severe thyroid eye disease uh, combined, uh, of course, age operation is the, be is the best way to deal with this patient. And this it happens just because every uh, surgery might influence the following surgical steps. So as we all know, we start with the nautical decompression, then we follow up with the business surgery, then we perform eyelid retraction correction, and then we do cosmetic surgery. So that's what we all were taught about and we probably were all been through that. But I'll show you some cases. This is a lady in which I did many, many years ago, a uh, bilateral free wall decompression. I was very happy about the result, but the lady was totally unhappy, so no smile on her face. 
factor because we all know that uh, a decompression has little or no effect on, on upper eyelid retraction. That was the, la the lady was complaining about. This is another lady who had a bilateral fibro decompression and again she wasn't happy and again the smile on her face only after another operation performing in one stage a bilateral blepharotomy and a lower eyelid retractor correction recession with a spacer. This happened again many years ago. And this is another gentleman with a right lower eyelid uh, retraction and uh, a, uh, right esotropia in which I dare many years ago to perform in one stage a very easy operation. So right medial rectus recession and lower eyelid retractus recession with a, a reasonable result. So all these things made me think a little bit. And to, when, when I've been through the literature, there are only very few reports of people who have attempted in the past to perform with good or reasonable result combined surgery. And this is why recently we have attempted in a very difficult cases who came over Rome and didn't have three or four years uh, to have full recovery. And as we all, we, you know, we don't have Topotumumab, unfortunately, in Italy and in Europe to perform uh, more surgical steps in one go. And so we try to evaluate the uh, efficacy and the safety of orbital decompression surgery combined with both Lucas and allied surgery in moderate to severe, severe cases. And uh, our original study was only about 20 conservative patients with an active uh, herod uh, associated orbitopathy that we treated with endoscopic medial wall decompression, then external decompression of the lateral wall if this was needed, and at the same time with eyelid retraction correction and or strabismus surgery. And at the same time, we performed two audits. The first comparing uh, uh, simultaneous decompression and uh, eyelid retractus correction with multi-step surgery. And at the, at the second audit was compare, uh, comparing simultaneous decompression and inferior rectus recession with people, with patients that had a two-step surgery. And we found out that uh, the changes in MRD1 were not significantly different among patients who, who had one-step surgery as opposed to patients with uh, stage surgery. And again, that the improvement in double vision was not significantly different in patients who had simultaneous strabismus and decompression surgery as opposed to patients who had sequential surgery. Let's go through some of my cases. So this had lady had simultaneous abrupt decompression and left blepharotomy, just similar cases, bilateral decompression and bilateral blepharotomy, again, bilateral decompression, bilateral blepharotomy, left decompression and left blepharotomy in one stage. This is an interesting case. We all know whenever, whenever we see a reduced torpedo aperture or ptosis, in this case, we sh should be very suspicious because there is a risk factor for this starry death with neuropathy. So this lady had a good decompression, right process correction, and a left blepharotomy in one stage. This again was an interesting case. This lady we had decreased vision. We did bilateral decompression and uh, uh, strabismus surgery in both eyes uh, in one stage, and you see the improvement of her visual fields in her best eye, which was the left eye, coloring the tooth. And again, more recent cases which are not included in the study. So this lady had bilateral decompression and metriomograph to lower eyelids at the same time. Cosmetic cases at the same time, decompression with a red and blepharoplasty. Again, another case. And another case, decompression, blepharotomy and lower blepharoplasty at the same time. This was a recent case. So bilateral decompression, left inferior rectus recession, this lady came from Sardinia, so this was her picture at day five. So first picture, Tuesday morning, second picture, Friday night. And when we don't do this, when we have, uh, 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 of course, isotropia, because we know that uh, um, even we are very careful, endoscopic decompression might influence um, the horizontal deviations of the eye. So in cases like this, we would do a bilateral decompression and bilateral inferior rectus recession in one stage and then save the left medial rectus resection for a second stage. How do we get there? Of course, the step towards 
endoscopic surgery was a big move forward because in this case, the, the, as we have said uh, before, the eye is left untouched. So you can go uh, forward with any other type of surgery on that eye, perform lateral decompression or strabismus or eyelid surgery at the same time. You have to preserve the strut, this is well known, but the other very important thing, we preserve uh, a band of medial periosteum because this allows the orbital content to prolax into uh, the, uh, uh, orbital, the mm, paranasal sinuses, but not completely and without displacing the content of the globe, which is very important. And another thing that we did, uh, in the past I uh, used to over correct, so to perform very big inferior rectus recession. What you get in this case is, is a, a very late over correction, like in this case, just one minute, please. And uh, so what we do now is just the intraoperative relaxed muscle positioning technique for strabismus surgery. You end up recessing the inferior rectus no more than four to five millimeters, and that is enough. And again, we all know that uh, upper lid surgery is best performed under LA because you can adjust the contour, you can adjust the height. But at the end of the day, we all do the same. So up to two millimeters, we would do, I, I think, a Mullerectomy. So that's what we do. And whenever we have more upper lid uh, retraction, up to three or four millimeters, we do a blepharotomy, which is very standardized in my experience, as you can see in this picture. And I prefer for lower eyelid retraction uh, not to use hard palate, which uh, ends up being very bulky most of the times, but I prefer either dermal graft or, of course, send dermal collagen implant. Alloderm is not available in Europe, unfortunately. So we all know that a four-stage operation is the best option. I wouldn't say anything against that, but in some cases, please think again and think that most patients would benefit from multi-step surgery. So if this were your next case, what would you do? This is my question, because the patient is coming very far from where you live. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. And um, I guess we have two more talks. So up next is uh, Dr. Ganga Sundar from National University Hospital and National University of Singapore, who's gonna talk with us about lacrimal microendoscopy. Thank you, Kai. Uh, uh, I cannot show you such pretty pictures, but I'll try to do this. So I'm gonna talk to you about some new techniques that we've been adopting in our practice for the past several years, which is lacrimal microendoscopy uh, as a replacement for external or endoscopy PCR. These are not displaces, there are no conflicts of interest, but for the youngsters, these are the books that they can read. So we all know about lacrimal drainage procedures, but there are newer things that's happening. That's VLDR and lacroendoscopy. You can combine them with the various other abdomen procedures itself. Yes, like uh, uh, Francisco mentioned, there's experience and evidence, and only time will tell what the long-term evidence is gonna be. Uh, just to draw attention to some of the legends who have created, and most of them are living with us. We lost uh, Her Jeff Hurwitz after the last archaeology museum in, uh, in Greece, Athens, but we now have two living legends who have all contributed to how we practice lacrimal drainage surgery. Just a quick overview about NLD obstructions. We can be classifying them into anatomical obstructions or functional obstructions. Surprisingly, even some kinds of functional obstructions we do with precision and bone removing that just to show our nostrils. So one of the terms which has never really caught on is the concept of lacrostenosis causing problems rather than just complete obstructions itself. And the treatment options, regardless of whatever you had, was a DCR, be it an external DCR or an endoscopic DCR. And to me, that's kind of mutilating surgery, although it's a surgery still I like to do when it really matters itself. And that's where learning from the masters, pioneers in the field really comes in. There's Emmerich from Germany who really introduced the original microendoscope. Then finally, Professor Zuki, who's introduced the semi-rigid endoscope and and Ray Havati, who's now working with a new endoscope itself. So endoscopy is not new. I think Kyle opened up the session talking about endoscopy for the orbit itself. Endoscopy of the nose is not new for us. And what about endoscopy inside the geoduct itself? And that's where these lacrimal microendoscopes come in. There are numerous uh, companies who are offering it. Stores has now discontinued their products. I use a polydiagnose when I'm doing these procedures in the general, under general anesthesia in the operating theater, or I use a semi-rigid uh, fiber tech endoscope. I've not tried them to see the effect yet. In the past, we could never see what is really going on inside. And the only way of knowing what is going on inside 
of the battery of this photon. So these are negative shadows. So we're looking at a shadow and interpreting what the human brain looks like. So we now have a potential possibility of visualizing various forms of pathologies, including polyps, tumors, necrosis, uh, uh, bacteroliths, and complete obstruction, fibrosis, suspension, so on and so forth. So this is an example of a real-time video of a lateral microendoscope. There's a huge learning curve really involved. But we are now able to see specific locations of obstructions, narrowing, fibrosis, fiddling material, debris, foreign bodies, even functional plugs that are closed in and, and migrated down the system itself. And these are examples of various pathologies you can now see, including broken <coughs> stems itself. So we have to be now familiar with, wha just as how we have to be familiar with various landmarks, we have to be familiar with the way uh, movement looks at various normal locations as well. So be a student of the normal before you go on to show the pathology. So this is an example of a patient of a local uh, lower end obstruction where you can see the stenosis is not complete, but enough that with intermittent swelling, you're gonna have a complete energy obstruction. So we started off doing them in the operating theater and the general anesthesia, but we're doing now more and more under ELA, which is endoluminal anesthesia. So here's an example of a patient where we are showing diffuse dactrostenosis. We pass the punctum, it has to be dilated. We pass the microendoscope along the canaliculus. Once you pass the common canaliculus into the lacrimal sac, usually it's a usually distended space because the lacrimal uh, sac is really swollen. Then you find your way down to the nasal lacrimal duct until the lower end where you really see an obstruction. So it's an example of a patient where now actually there's a distended lacrimal sac. And this is where in the past, regardless of what the pathology was, regardless where the obstruction was, if you were doing a one-size-fits-all diaphrosis for rhinostomy-like procedure, you can see the humongously dilated with multiple mucosal holes that you can go all the way down to where the obstruction is. And this is important not only to identify pathology, but if you're able to identify the most of the obstruction way down below, these are the patients that lend themselves into good, successful endoluminal lacrimal duct depenalization. This is a video which just won an award at the Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology prepared by my fellow one of the audio works over there or not. So I think this is the final frontier of macular brain surgery. For recording purposes, we're using this surgical video we did in the operating theater, but we're gonna kind of give you a map of what we really do. We do an endoluminal anesthesia, and that's a three-port microendoscope. You can introduce your third instrument of a drill laser if you want, but I tend to use a mechanical recanalization itself. And as you go down the punctum into the proximal and distal canaliculus, you can see the various landmarks right over here. It's quite narrow, especially in patients who have chronic obstructions. Then you go into the lacrimal sac where it's nice and beautifully distended, and as you go down the nasal lacrimal duct, you find where the pathology is. Once you find the pathology, this has a shaft which can recanalize, following which you can confirm patency. I use intraoperable uh, transom alone, and either I would use a balloon dactroplasty or I would do a straight old fashioned bicanalic intubation itself. So various forms of recanalization exist. To me, mechanical recanalization is still the way to go. The numerous advantages to this procedure, like any endoscopy procedure, the downtime is very minimal. Success rate may not be as high as a conventional external endoscopy DCR, but there are specific patients where I think there are definite indications for this rather than a mutilating procedure. You can, uh, in the interest of time, I could probably stop right over there. But you have to understand lacrimal drainage pathology. This is not a procedure for everybody. It is not a procedure when people have secondary acquired lacrimal duct obstruction. This is not a procedure where you may have malignant tumors inside. But in patients who have the typical pander with lower or inferior end NLD obstruction, this is a good alternative. And this has completely changed the spectrum of lacrimal drainage procedures that we do in Optifi. So in summary, I think it's now important for us to understand and familiarize with the new technologies which are really available usually minimally invasive. I think the only person who now does is somebody in Philadelphia or uh, Pittsburgh who is starting to do this, although I know it's not considered a standard billable procedure in the United States. But these are procedures which are quite popular in the Asia Pacific and the Far East, and I'd like to take this opportunity to both of you and Christian Aubrey and Vidi uh, to join us in October. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And for our last talk, we have Dr. Ruchi Goh, who will be talking about subperiosteal implants for periocular uh, anterior sulcus deformity. As far as I know, she's not coming because she's launching her book upstairs. Very good. She sent me a text. Which she's in that case, we'll wrap up here. Uh, yeah. I don't know if we have one time for questions or just end the session. for every speaker. <laughs> I start off with something if you want. Sure. Yeah, let's take so it. So great experience. We started doing tones. And the first time I did my tones was when I accidentally breached the deep lateral wall the dura and the temporal lobe of the brain. So that was my inadvertent tones. Yeah, sure. The question for you was pediatric experience. 
We've done a couple of cases, mostly mostly from multi-spatial tumors, um, tumors that are kind of basically encroaching on intracranial space, and where we didn't want to do a, a you know full craniotomy, so either for diagnostic purposes or for resection. And you know they've mostly been subtotal resections um, when done in that fashion, but we have done a few. Um, I think probably two or three cases in the mice total. So we have done a few, but not all. The vast majority of our series have been adults. Any other questions? I'm adding my voice to uh, Francesco. We, we have been doing more than one procedure on the thyroid patients at the same time, and we're getting uh, good results. So definitely, that, that's, that's a good thing to do, go with. Yes, thank you. I don't think it's, I mean, you have to customize the surgery. I, I wouldn't say that the prostate surgery is wrong, but it's not like a rule that is true for, for everybody. So, I mean, in any surgery, we think before performing surgery, if patients come from, uh, I mean, for the American colleagues, uh, it's much easier because they won't have very bad cases. They don't, you don't have bad, very bad cases anymore. So, I mean, you're trying, you're now performing surgery, normal surgeries, normal swing surgery. I have lots of American friends who have seen the results of Kuban, tried a donkey cow, what what Don does in his uh, swing patients. So that it's now it's different, but for us which is a big area of the world. Uh, we still have to do it for a few years probably with these bad patients. So I think it's a good option. Yeah, I think Don Kikau and David Grant had published previously on combining just strabismus surgery with retraction repair and they found it was great for small angle strabismus, not larger, which was uh, uh, not involving you. the vertical muscle. Yeah. Sorry, a question for you actually. I mean, uh, which are the cases where you will never do a combined you know, composite surgery? There are some cases which come, for example, with um, uh, one is just a practical uh, reason. So sometimes the patients come for optic neuropathy that does not respond to steroids. You have to perform a decompression. You don't have a available surgical time. So you have to plan it long in advance. So this is for stable cases. So I did a couple of cases. In this case, so I ha had surgical time because of cancellation, so I could perform that one, that, that lady with the superior rectus resection and the inferior rectus resection. Uh, the cases are either because patients, some patients don't want uh, bilateral decompression, so th they don't want that, so they are afraid of the results because they read uh, very well the consent form, so they're afraid of that. Others have been told by other surgeons that th this is uh, very bad, so that you should have uh, uh, four or eight surgeries in two years, this happens, or in redo cases. When I redo cases, uh, then I'm very careful. There is actually no reason not to perform the media rectus recession as well at the same time, but some patient, because there are even reports in the literature well before me that say, uh, one is by Dan Rutman actually, and uh, it's been, demonstrated that even you have might have an improvement of isotropia following decompression, not necessarily it get worse. But still, if you have it before, and you, then you can be more precise afterwards. Uh, redo orbital decompressions or uh, patients that have, uh, do, uh, need, do need an orbital decompression, but they had, these cases happen in Italy, they had lead surgery before the decompression. Uh, actually, my squint partner is presenting in this meeting the result of doing the lip and the muscle surgery together in thyroid patients. But I'm sure most of us have done it before. Uh, but th this is this tendency to say that it should not be done. Can I ask uh, My uh, colleagues, sorry. I mean, we do lid and uh, in the muscle surgeries routinely. So, I mean, so far, so good. Yes. I have a question for you. I'm very interested about your uh, program uh, for the residents and fellow, which is uh, very new, so I mean, we can discuss it later, <laughs> probably. So, um, which are the centers in the states that follow that program? You say you have 150. Well, we 
individual user can sign up for it. So anybody, and there are 150 countries, so here's just 150 countries. Um, so yeah, for the most part, Orbis does tries to provide access to anybody in the world who wants to get into this. Um, and I know individual programs like in Toronto, our program, there's, it's not, uh, in our program, it's a formal part of the curriculum. Um, and I think in other places, people are using it as an adjunct, as opposed to a required part of the curriculum. Uh, it, it, it's very interesting because the States actually is the only country in the world where you have very well codified. I know wh there would be a difference between a fellowship done here and another done there, obviously, but still uh, the program is very uh, codified and, and really well scheduled. So after a two-year fellowship, I think any American fellow would have an, a reasonable amount of surgery done and rounds, etc. In Europe, as you probably know, it's completely different. So I've been working the last five years <laughs> to try to equalize the system. So we did the book, we did an exam. To, uh, but we are still very far from that result. So I'm very interested. Yeah, the nice thing about this is there's actually, you can't just click through and like we try to do for some of these courses. Uh, and there's a pre and post test to see if it's actually going with it. Just a follow-up question, it's great as well. I'll now introduce it to my fellows. But uh, is this a certifiable course? Do you attach a certificate at the end of it, number one? Number two, any linkage with ICO as well? Because I think ICO is a global outreach. And that's something, and uh, I don't know if you're going to Vancouver or not. If you're not going, you should go. And probably present it over there because the whole world's gonna be there. Um, and anyway, you can facilitate it. Yeah, I just have one question to Dr. Kanga. Uh, when you use the uh, DACA endoscope guided uh, silicone intubation, what uh, intubation set do you use? Use the same old fashioned Crawford intubation system as uh, a silicone you, on a polyurethane. Do you use like the ones they do in Japan? Do, do you, put, do you the sheet the, type. Yeah, nunchaku type. Do you no, sheet I don't use the nunchaku type. So that actually will be the actual the guided real DACA endoscope. Real, uh, DACA endoscope. The same DACA endoscope guided intubation. There's a DACA endoscope guided recanalization followed by traditional old-fashioned intubation. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's what uh, I do, yeah, yeah, but you're right. Okay, but you don't use the nunchak? Uh, no, uh, thank we you. are kind of limited, like in the United States, uh, what is approved in the country, what technology is approved. Not very many companies are very keen to invest in Singapore because we are too small a market, so kind of limited by what we have. But we make do with what we have. We have to take the lead then, and we'll give you the technology <laughs> in India. If no other questions, we can wrap up there. Um, so thank you to our panelists and our few audience members. And it was a great session and uh, nice to all get together. So thank you. Thank you very much. I think there is an uh, auditorium. There's some function going on, including a book release, followed by dinner. So please don't disappear unless you want to go and see the wild side of it. Dinner will be at the banquet uh, across the road. <laughs> <laughs>